morning <clears throat> and welcome. Uh, my name is, is Nate Thompson. I am the pastor here at Hope Church, and so I want to welcome you. It's, it's, we are here to remember, uh, honor, and celebrate the life of Phyllis Rayville, who was a faithful wife of 63 years, mother, grandmother, friend, sister, and as you can see, musician, and an and avid traveler. And so this morning, it's in our, our grief, it's in our sorrow as we come to say goodbye, that we, we turn to the scriptures to hear God comfort those who mourn. And so, before we do that, one quick announcement. If you don't have a program, they are available in the back. And if you are, are reading or singing, um, this will tell you when to, to please come up here, and I will, that will allow me to, to operate the soundboard. So let, let's, let's listen to the scriptures. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold, and not another. Jesus, our Redeemer, says to us, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died. But look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Let's pray. Our Father and our good God, we come this morning to bring our tears, to bring our sorrow uh, to you, asking for comfort, asking for help, asking for mercy, uh, asking for your perfect love, which, which is new for us every morning, to come and be with us. Uh, we thank you for the holy sympathy of Jesus, your beloved Son, who though fully God became human like us, and in his humanity knows the pain that we feel. For he too suffered grief and loss. And as the one who is alive is sympathizing with us, as our compassionate king, our resurrected savior, the one who defeated death, we thank you that he promises to be with us as our sympathetic friend. So right now, comfort us, use this time to assure us in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection from the dead and walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Underneath your chairs, you'll find a hymn book. So we're going to sing When Morning Gilds the Skies. It's number 167. It's the red one.
reading from Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation.
Good morning. It's good to see you all here. Red and Phyllis always did a great job of bringing us all together, and I'm grateful for that. And I think growing up, that's one of the things that stands out to me the most. You know, walking into that door at 44 East Main Street and smelling the bread baking, or the late nights, the game nights in which we were out way past our bedtime, and of course the photo albums that we would never let our girlfriends see in the future. But uh, it was that sense of family that was there under that roof, different generations. And this was a house they shared with all of us. It was our house as well, both figuratively and at times literally. And, um, and I'm grateful for that. And I guess Phyllis is known for having said that uh, charity begins in the home. And looking back, I can see that. And I can feel that. And that's such an important thing to be surrounded by as a kid growing up. Uh, forever grateful. Charity begins in the home. And, um, you know, every year she and my grandfather would call on your birthday and they would sing. And this was a tradition that was later carried on with Phyllis and Janine as well, and I can still hear that. I still feel that, you know, on my birthday. Um, I remember there was a point in time in my life in which I knew I wanted to make music, maybe not in the traditional sense, but it really felt like a true calling. I mean, it runs in, in the family. But of course, we grew up around people who are, who've been playing music their whole life. I mean, grandmother played six instruments, several different bands. Uh, grandfather very much did the same thing. So I was hesitant to share what I thought was a calling. And uh, of course, one day, though, my grandmother said, what is it that you want from life? What are you going to do? I said, Grandma, I'm going to make music. I want to make music. And then I braced myself because, as you guys might know, Grandma does have a history of being rather blunt. <laughs> and so she said, well, it's not going to make you any, uh, any money. I said, okay. But she said, it's good for the soul, and I'm happy for you. And I felt that, and I needed that at the time. Um, I remember the first time going and uh, looking at the detail that she put into the family tree that extend generations before us, and as we saw it start to extend generations beyond us and considered the time and the thoughtfulness and the research that she put in to create this uh, and to give back as a gift to her family because charity starts in the home. And uh, to me, that was grandma. But I, I guess it wasn't until she passed uh, that I uh, began to understand a little bit more who Phyllis Rabel was. And uh, this was a person of focus, of quiet determination, uh, an individual who, you know, as a kid taught herself piano, French horn, you name it. Uh, she came up in the era of the Great Depression and worked her way through school, into college, and on to her masters, I think maybe a couple of them. Uh, she, she was a doer, man, she loved to live, learn, do, and um, she loved to travel. She loved to read. She spent 20 years as a librarian at the uh, Sherburne Orville Central School. She had to be right in heaven right there. And, um, and at the time as a kid, all I knew was that grandma liked her crossword puzzles. She liked words. Uh, but I, I didn't consider what those words meant to her as she filled them in, I didn't consider that they were connected to things and to memories, maybe places that she's gone, things she's seen, books she's read. Um, I didn't think that maybe some of those words reminded her of the first time that she and Red danced at that faculty mixer 70 plus years ago, or how that dance inspired a family of her own, 
four kids, ten grandkids, nine great grandkids, maybe ten now. Man. You know, it's a it's a it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. I just recently got married two weeks ago. Beautiful wife here, Destiny. And uh, that morning, the ring I put on her finger was the same one that my grandmother wore for 63 years in her marriage, and um, in which she gave as a gift to us as we started our family. Because again, charity starts in the home. And although she couldn't be at the wedding, of course she was there in spirit and in conversation and um, memory. Uh, but she did get the opportunity to see uh, Destiny in her wedding dress. Uh, we took a trip out to see, you know, Phyllis and Janine to visit. And Destiny was so excited to show her and tell her the story of how all of her friends surprised her. They pitched in and bought the dress for her and surprised her. So she's telling the story and she's flipping through the photos with my grandma and with Janine. And uh, of course, I'm not allowed to look. I'm on the other side of the room. But afterwards, I said, uh, Grandma, how'd she look? And she said, Oh, just terrible. <laughs> Which makes me smile every time I think about it. Uh, but, you know, it's stories like those or it's moments like these uh, and people like her. It doesn't just end, you know. It continues to give. Um, it continues to grow much like that family tree. And I think this was something that Phyllis knew. Uh, and because she did, uh, we do. So, uh, Grandma, love you forever. Third Psalm. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for, you, for thou art with me. The rod and, thy rod and thy staff, if they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. The, the, thou anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
2 Corinthians. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise, also, uh, will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us uh, for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. My condolences for your loss. I mean, listening to those stories, yeah, felt like a reminded me of walking into my grandmother's home <laughs> for part of it. Just could smell the bread baking. So, yeah, sorry for your loss. And as as we I want to take, I want to take a couple minutes here to listen to have God speak to us and meditate on Jesus's words. Um, Jesus says. Um, there's a couple, couple different passages here. It says, one, I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. That's from Jeremiah. And then Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is God's word. Let, let me pray for a moment. Father, we ask that you would use these words to draw near and comfort those who mourn so that the resurrection of Christ would be our sure and steadfast anchor in the storms of our grief. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Jesus has the audacity to say to those who mourn, um, to put that next to a, a word, the word blessed. And blessed is a word that overlaps with happiness. Right? And so this is a really awkward thing to say. To say, happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, I, I didn't have the privilege of meeting Phyllis, and, and it's evidenced by the, the, the service this morning. Um, most of what I've heard about her is her musical skills. Um, as a fellow French horn player, it was, it was fun to, to, to know that uh, we had some overlap, but you know, music heals the soul. And has the power to help us through hard emotions. And I, I, this is what Jesus is saying to us. Uh, that, that there is a melody playing in the heart of every Christian. And it's a joyful melody. Uh, that's always playing in the background. Even while tears of sorrow and loss fall down our faces. Uh, in other words, it's a, it's a song. Uh, it's what the hymn says. There's an eternal song. May Jesus Christ be praised that allows us to hope even while we mourn. And so how does that work? Well, one, it's helpful to say out loud that as Christians, mourning is okay, right? The, the, the song doesn't uh, kill our emotions. Right? The, the, the passage that, that I read from Jeremiah is addressed to people who are languishing. They've experienced unimaginable loss. Uh, they're disoriented, they're scattered, they're confused, they're in pain, all those emotions that grief causes. And in the surrounding verses, we hear God saying things like this, I see you. Uh, I hear your weeping, and I, your God, who loves you with an everlasting love, I will, I will comfort you, and I will turn your sorrow into joy. See, 
Right now, we're, we're feeling and, and experiencing and seeing the world as it is under the curse. Uh, the message of the Bible is that we are made for unending relationships. And so, this is painful. This, some of us get angry. Um, right, we're, we're, we're running into what the Bible calls our enemy, death. And God, being, being gracious, knowing what we go through, he, he expects that even having the hope of resurrection from the dead doesn't exempt you from mourning. Right? So Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. And because we know this is not how the world ought, is, ought to be, often we mourn more. <laughs> right? And so... I just want to encourage you right now, it's good and right to give those words and, and to our emotions, to express our anger, to express our sorrow, to say, I, I do not want to say goodbye. Right? To, to acknowledge that death really does feel like an enemy. It's not natural. And the beauty of that is we do that, according to Jeremiah, armed with the Lord's sympathy and his attention. That he sees he hears, he knows, and as we read, he, he's made plans to turn our sorrow into joy. Right? And we know this because of Jesus, this Lord who became human like us. And two of the most powerful words written in Scripture about him are this, Jesus wept. Right? So when when you come to Jesus, you're coming to a person who wept in anguish, in loss for his friend, who's, who entered into the sorrow of Mary, who was missing her brother. Uh, and Jesus, who was sitting at the right hand of God, who is as fully human now as he was at that funeral. Right? We're given a glimpse of this is how Jesus grieves and reacts to uh, with those he loves. He sympathizes. Right? And so this counsel is, is, yeah, it is right to mourn. And mourn knowing that, that, that Jesus knows how you feel and he moves towards those who grieve and that encourages us to move towards him. And then, second, what is the, the melody of comfort and joy that keeps us afloat, uh, that holds on to us while we, we grieve? Right. God says, I'm going to turn your mourning, mourning into joy. I'm going to give you gladness in the place of sorrow. Um, I, mean, I think real comfort is only possible with, with hope. Uh, specifically, a settled confidence and belief in the resurrection from the dead. And that's the melody we have playing in our hearts. Uh, that the death is not the end. That joy unending is coming. As one pastor put it, there, there is joy available that the deepest grief cannot put out. Uh, no circumstance or person can take away the joy that God gives in the gospel. How do you get that joy? Uh, Jesus died. On the night before Jesus died, he told his friends, uh, all those who love him, you, you, you're going to grieve. This is going to hurt. I'm going to go away from you referring to his death on the cross. But then he goes on to say, well, but I will see you again. And your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Right? See, for Jesus, what he was saying is, when you see me alive on the other side of the grave, walking out of that empty tomb, that's your confirmation. That there's no sound, no misery that can drown out that song of hope. You know, your future joy was made secure. And that's the comfort that Jesus is talking about. Blessed is the, are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Because the God of the Bible is the God who wipes away tears, as we heard earlier. Resurrection is coming. Look, I don't know how much you think about heaven, I hate to break it to you, but the, the, the Christian ideal is not floating up into the, into the skies and playing harps and hanging out with angels. Uh, the, the Bible's portrait is much 
much more human, um, much more physical, because we're going to have new bodies. There'll be eating and drinking. Um, you think of meeting the one who's making all things new. He's Part of the promise of the gospel is he has gone up into heaven to prepare a place for you. And it's going to be the most welcoming home that you can imagine. Right? It's going to put all our grandmothers to shame. <laughs> right? and, and so as he makes a new heaven, a new earth, where death is, is just a bad dream, a bad memory, the, the bonus that comes for Christians is we'll get to reunite with our family in Christ. We'll join the, the company singing that song, Thank You, Jesus, as those who have overcome death as well through faith in the one who loved us and gave himself up for us. And so that's why we say there is a song that plays and calms our hearts even as we grieve. Um, because our future, our hope, our comfort, as Jeremiah says, this is what God is planning to do. I will give you this comfort. Now, now why, how do you get that? Why, why did Jesus come to die? It's real brief. To bring salvation. Right? We, we live in a world that goes not well, and, and this is a runaway world. And well, I'll put it this way, as musicians know, if you have someone in an orchestra who decides to ignore the conductor and ignore the music and go, go rogue, it sounds terrible. Right? It kills the beauty, and you're going to offend the conductor and probably lose your chair. <laughs> and if everyone in the band did the same thing and played louder so that everyone could pay attention to them, all right, it's chaos. And that's, that's, that's the portrait of the world. When the Bible says it's gone wrong, it's, it's partially because of us. That's what the Bible calls sin. And so Jesus didn't just come to save us from sorrow. He came to save us from what causes sorrow. Us, ourselves, our sin. And he's so gracious, he's saying, I'm, I'm willing to overlook that to forgive that. And so Jesus died and rose again to give, give us gladness, to give us a joy that no sorrow can drown. So, may, may you know the comfort of Jesus this morning. May you hear that song playing. May it, may it comfort your soul uh, that right now, yeah, it's painful. It hurts. It, there's a real hole in saying goodbye to someone who loved well. And so the counsel is to come to the one who perfectly loves and lean on him in the coming days. Come, come and receive the gift he, he gives through faith and get to know the one who would weep for the loss of his heavenly father so you could rejoice and know God's comfort. And then you understand Jesus' words, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now let's pray. Father, I ask now for everyone here that you would deal graciously with those who mourn, that they would cast all their care upon you, that they would know the consolation and the ever-present comfort of your, your love. Give them strength for the coming days when their, their hearts ache, I'm missing Phyllis. Grant them the courage to believe in light of the great hope of the resurrection, and may that song never be snuffed out. Uh, to know that, that, that comfort, eternal comfort, that is greater than we can imagine is coming. And so we thank you for Jesus, who was our anchor in this storm, and give us faith to keep believing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to go turn on the music.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all as you go through the valley of the shadow of death. The Lord, may the Lord be with you. Amen. There is a reception downstairs that everyone is invited to. Um, we, will, we will have people posted to help you find it.